We are here in Dan Morgan's living room. No, <laughs> but that's what you want it to have the feel of. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's a nice way to put it. I kind of like people to feel at home here. And it's a bookstore in Prague. What part of Prague? It's in Prague 6. It's kind of a turn-of-the-century neighborhood. It was all fields in the 1880s, 1890s, and was very quickly built up from about 1900 to 1920. Yeah, and it's easy to get to. It's like 15 minutes, if that, on the, uh, on the superb public transportation here, the tram. Yeah, right from the center. Yeah, and it's also a nice walk, like a 20-minute walk down to the center. You've got, actually, the Prague Castle is uh, very close to, to Prague 6. And, uh, and you also have the, the Russian Embassy, which is really interesting because uh, you have a lot of Russian-speaking people living in this neighborhood. You, also, you often hear Russian on the, on the buses. And, and there's also a, a nice mix of uh, the expat community and Czechs. So, yeah, we, I've always wanted to have a bookstore in, in this specific neighborhood. Okay, so uh, what uh, took you to Prague in the first place? Well, I was working as a landscaper in, in France, and uh, I met my wife. She was visiting uh, France, and we were an, in Antibes, at Cap d'Antibes. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so we met. She invited me to come to Prague. I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. So when the season ended... I gave my notice and, and came to Prague and uh, found a job, as so many Americans did in the early and mid-90s, uh, teaching English. And you obviously stayed then. Yeah, my wife, my, well, my wife uh, had invited me originally for two weeks, and uh, she wasn't my wife at the time. We got married four years later and, uh, yeah, stayed. I was teaching for through the mid-90s, and then I got a job at the Czech Press Agency, uh, translating and proofreading around the year 2000. I was a freelance translator, and I got into books at around, oh, I think like around 2008. And what does that mean? Well, that means that I was living up in another area of Prague 6, and there was a used bookstore across the street from my flat. It was called Chesky Antiquariat, which is basically Czech used books. And they're only open uh, one day a week in the afternoon. It was run by the Termals. It was at that time it was just Mrs. Termalova who was who was running the business. Yeah, so I went in there and uh, she was very kind and started to to realize that I, I, I had an interest in, in books. And she, she introduced me to Czech modernism, Czech modernist book design, woodcuts by Czechs like Josef Vakal. And, and so it was really pleasurable for me to, to get this in through someone who was so knowledgeable. Yeah, so I, I started my own meager collection through her. I started as a collector. You come by it honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then they, they closed up about five years ago. Mrs. Termalova passed away. Just by chance recently, I saw her daughter outside of the, of the closed-up bookstore. They still had all the books in it. And I asked her what was, was going to happen to the books, and uh, she said, oh, it's too bad, but just, I, I just missed out because she'd arranged for somebody to come buy all the books up. But she took my number just in case it, it fell through, and... Just last month, she called me. That fell through, and I and I went up, and I, I actually bought the entire stock of, of Mrs. Termalva's bookstore, the first bookstore that, that actually began my interest in Czech books. So I, I feel like it was it was meant to be. That really is well coming full circle. There's yeah. a, a lovely karma to it. What did she have that excited you the most then? She had a very small bookshop, but they had, they had an incredible collection, and they, they had run an auction since the early 90s, the Termals. So in their bookstore, they didn't have their top items, but they had, they had great, uh, you know, just a great overview of books from 
before the revolution from the first republic where are those dates so the first republic is from the founding of Czechoslovakia in 1918 to the Nazi occupation in 1939. She also started my interest in Samizdat, which was the illegal publications uh, during the communist years. And that was fascinating for me. And also my, my wife is a art theoretician who, who deals in this area of kind of illegal performance art of the 1970s. So our interests kind of overlapped and I was able to kind of find a, an area of interest in within these illegally published magazines. There's nothing really I mean, special about them, is there? I mean, there's no production value. It's just like type exactly. written things that are handed around, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just pamphlets and that's how it would work. It was, you would get... You would get from your friend, somebody you could trust. You would get to maybe a, a, a typed a translation of Orwell's 1984, and you could have it for a week. And the price of being lent this was that you were to make two more copies mm-hmm. and to return the, the copy with one of your copies so that it could be spread to, to more people. So it wasn't their own work. Or was it? Well, yeah, there's two types of Samizdat. Yeah, there was the, the Samizdat, which was illegal publication from abroad and from Czech writers. But the Samizdat publishers here were quite active. There was uh, a number, especially in the 1970s, a number of illicit uh, operations that were producing, within the possibilities, quite quality uh, works by Czech artists, by Czech uh, writers. Ludwig Václík was was probably the one who spearheaded this operation the most. He was in the late seventies. He was just indefatigable creator of Czech uh, samizdat. And actually, just to get off of the for a moment, this is one of the great things about starting this bookstore because you know Nigel that I've I've tried to also have these cultural evenings. Yeah. And the first cultural evening, we 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 showed a screening of of this film. Feicher, one of the characters was the Czech writer Arnold Lustig. And one of the, the people that came to look at the film was this elderly Swedish man. And I just got talking to him. I was just, you know, so how are you enjoying Prague? And he's like, oh, yeah, I was, I was here. I've been here a number of times. Even I was here in the 70s. And I was like, wait a minute, who are you? And he was actually involved with uh, smuggling these Samizdat works in and out of the country. Yeah. And so I heard the, his, his story and... Uh, How did he hear about your evening? Keith Jones, oh, yes. who knows everybody yes. from these these generations, brought him here. So Keith, Keith has been great for that. Why is that exactly what you want then? That's what I want. I, did, I want this to be uh, an interesting cultural space and uh, I want I want these stories. That's, the, that's also the thing about moving from being just like an online dealer to having a space is you just, you end up hearing so many s- stories that you would never been privy to. You know, I'm go- I'm go- I'm now I'm going on book runs where I put my number in a local paper and you go to these people's houses, you know, they're looking to, to sell their, their libraries. And you sit down with these people, most of them who are like between the ages of 70 and 90, and they, they want to tell their story. They, they tell the stories of how they got the books and they tell their stories of like, you know, just basically their stories of the 20th century. And they're just fascinating. I got a call from this former professor here at the Czech Technical University who was, he was beside himself because his, his children didn't want his library. So, so was, he wanted me to come take a look at it. And he had a great library for reading, but it was nothing I wanted. But we were sitting down next to his bookshelves and he was telling me about you know his he was born in, in the early 1930s and he at one point he reaches over and he points to a book and it, it's gone with the wind uh, a Czech translation from, from the mid 40s and he said I was reading this book as a nine-year-old when my father was taken for interrogations by the communists, and I never saw him again. That was just, you know, yeah. such a such a powerful experience to, which I would never, I've been, you know, as a, as an online 
fire, which I was 10 years before this, I would never have been, I never heard these stories. I mean, this is, this is like history that you're, you're present at listening to these stories. Yeah, it's one of the aspects of, of being a, well, you still would have gotten that though, because you want to buy books for your online store as well as your reg, your regular store. Right. But, right. But, but, but you weren't going out uh, seeking stuff from real people uh, at their houses. Is that yeah, it? that's it. I was yeah. sending money to their bank account. <laughs> and uh, basically everything I have here is what I have online. Uh, you okay. know, I don't have, I mean, I have, I have now I have a, a small storage area where I where have all of uh, Mrs. Termalva's books, but and I haven't gone through them, but everything I've bought that hasn't been sold in the past 10 years is, is in this space now. So the Samistat, you just kind of go around to various bookstores and find this stuff? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's basically like, you know, typewritten an essay. It's, it's of varying quality, but there's some, there's some fascinating things there. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the Samistat is about like the music scene, it's about the, the art scene, it's mm. about, there's budding poets, which doesn't interest me that much. Mm. I mean, I, I very much like the, the Samis that, that it, it kind of informs about a certain group of people and what they were trying to do and, you know, how they were trying to uphold this, this, this cultural program that was not approved by the officials. And that fascinates me. Why? Well, because a lot of it is still not recorded in, you know, in, as official history. So you, you can find out certain things that you've never heard before through the, through these publications so they, these people people who were, were important actors actually there just came out a great book on on the czech summit from 2018 it hasn't been translated to english but absolutely uh, amazing overview of it i bet i go through there and you can still find this by walking into a used bookstore yeah because again it looks like nothing nothing that you really anyone would want no i mean that's the that's the magic of it is that uh, often you'll find it in stacks of magazines that nobody wants yeah. although it's it's also available online and people there are a lot of people who know it's about who's know there's value in them right kind of like know that that's the direction that that's one of the directions the collection is going now in some is that particularly or or what yeah there's a lot of collectors well there are I know a number of collectors who who focus on Sami's dot and these pamphlets. You know, it's a nice compliment to getting the, once they you know gone through all of this, they start publishing actual books, right? So you can kind of trace it all the way back. Yeah, yeah, and that's what this I think it's Mikhail Shibram's book does. It, it t- chase, traces the history of of, of Sami's dot in this country, and uh, it, it's it's a great field to be into. Here because you know it's not expensive. You can, as a collector, you can also, if you know what you're looking for, you can, you can amass a, a decent collection mm-hmm. uh, without having to take out a loan. But that isn't really your focus these days, or is it your specialty? Well, it's one of my focus. It's, it's actually one of the areas I find the most most fascinating, the most informative for me. But as you know, I, I my focus is is still uh, avant garde book design. Uh, modernist book design, and uh, and that's what I have a small exhibition here now on the book design of Otokar Merkvichka from 1920 to about 1930, focusing on his photo montage and constructivist works. Yeah, so maybe what what you can do is get to the the root or the the beginning of the look of these. Uh, magazines and books that were that were designed in the in the 20s and 30s here you know there's so many isms dadaism and constructivism and formalism and symbolism and but cubism really and i'll quote (laughs) philip cooper in his book on cubism published by faden well, back in 1995, he said, uh, Cubism constitutes the greatest upheaval in art since the Renaissance, 
the artist was no longer obliged to depict objects naturalistically, but was also influenced by his mental conception of them. Traditional perspective was abandoned, and objects were often splayed out to show them from several viewpoints and only a few defining details might be included. For example, a button to indicate clothing or a mustache to suggest a man's head. Further, greater freedom was allowed than before in manipulating the subject matter to unify the composition. The elements in a picture might be chosen and placed purely according to aesthetic considerations rather than being firmly based on reality. So what do you think about that? Well, that was a major moment, obviously, in, in Czech art, embracing of Cubism, especially from, from Paris. In, in Czech book design, which is my area, it was this, this period from World War I to about 1920 was marked by the young generation's movement away from secessionism, from Art Nouveau, and searching for a new style uh, of book des design. This was led by people like Josef Chopik and, and uh, Carol Tiger and the line to, to Paris, to, to Cubist painting was, was quite strong, this embracing, this trying to get away from the old Czech art. And so you have this, you have this movement of what is called the angular style in, in Czech book design or, or Cubist uh, book design. Jindrik Toman wrote a, a great monograph on, on this, uh, published about, uh, I think about 10 years ago, where he mapped this explosive time in Czech book design. And so you have like, uh, it, it, it actually ran in parallel with, with this architectural style called Cubism or, or Rondo Cubism, which was actually a specialty here in Prague. And uh, so you have a, you, you actually see quite abrupt movement from from this away from Art Nouveau at this time and uh, mm -hmm. the uh, book designs from like nineteen you can find from nineteen eighteen to like nineteen twenty one they really went for this cubist design and it was it, they're really quite striking and unique you don't as far as I know you don't find it in, in other countries it was really quite this homegrown. Czech style, and it, 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 it laid the groundwork for modernist book design, I believe, like this real, this idea of, of and even uh, this, this idea of getting away from the flowery ornamental mm -hmm. and going towards something much more striking, much more visually, like a poster for the book. Uh, for, first of all, you, you think that Czech book design was out front of everyone else? I don't know enough about the European book designs of like the parallel movements. I will say that I do, I do think that the Cubist book design by Czechs is, is a unique homegrown movement. I think that the later modernist design by people like Sutnar, Ladislav Sutnar, was very much influenced by Bauhaus and by the Dutch. But you have a figure named uh, uh, an artist named Karl Tiger, who I think Tiger did more for Czech book design in these early years, and and getting the young book designers to to completely abandon secessionism than anyone else. And he was radical. Uh, Can about you define secessionism? Art Nouveau. Yeah. yeah. This ornate, flowery. Yeah. Beautiful, but kind of traditional, staid. It's like this sort of. With, with cubism, this sort of fragmentation, almost explosion of like blowing that stuff up. That's literally. That's a good way to put it, I think. It, it was. And also, I think with the secessionist book designs, a lot of the time the, the ornaments didn't really have that much to do with the theme of the book. With this, the, you know, the, the cubist uh, book design was very much meant for like this young literature this like to show that there's this kind of like this, this explosion of ideas and uh, and and also you had certain th thematical ties with what was in the poetry like with Apollinaire's poetry or with uh, this up these up-and-coming proletarian writers 
Uh, so you had a much more like visually striking, but at the same time attached to the content of the book, some some kind of visual. Part, there was well with the cubism, there was a lot of punning and wordplay. I mean, they actually took pieces of newspaper and stuck it onto the surface, right? And this whole idea of collage and uh, montage, it all comes out of Picasso originally, his work. That's, yeah, and that's, we're getting now into the, like 1923, 24, where Ty, Taiga and his uh, fellow members of Deviat, so the, the, the group of young progressive artists, uh, right around 19, it was founded around 1920, they then started moving into this collage and photo montage and uh, yeah so I think the new word the new catchphrase for this was poetism and they were using collage they were using these textual inserts in also in the in the image to sort of generate these ideas of, of movement of excitement mm -hmm. of, of the mo excitement for the modern modern world for technology yeah for exotic places and travel and uh, it's amazing because it's just a few years after Cubism, but Cubist book design, I mean, I'm talking about Cubist, the angler style now, it, it stopped quite abruptly. Uh, and you had like uh, from 1923, 24, this real movement to this, what you're talking about, the collage. But, the, but this, is, this is what Picasso was doing maybe 15 years earlier, let's say. It's an interesting relationship between real artists and, <laughs> and artists who have may have an, another agenda who are using these techniques to get a message across that well that's thanks to i think that's, that's thanks to uh, carol Tiger, who was a he spoke fluent french he was translating from french he was going to paris on a regular basis and he was a jack of all trades he was he was he was painting in the early 20s he was he was writing these theoretical text. He, he was he was making woodcuts. He was making illustrations for books. He was designing covers. He was doing everything. But typography. He, typography. Yeah, yeah. And also, of course, that's how can I leave that out? The typ typography. Yeah. yeah. As you saw in Ebeseda, very like uh, strikingly new. Uh, yeah, you should maybe talk quickly about that. That's a yeah an ABC book, but it's a yeah. So I consider that as like the holy grail of of Czech. <laughs> modernist typography so you had the modernist experimental type typography of Carol Taiga with the modernist dance images of this of this wonderful dancer named Noce Mayerova combined with the modernist verse of another um, Deviat Sill member uh, Vitislav Nezval who is also um pushing poetry and embracing sort of French experimental poetry at the time and trying to like move Czech poetry in, in that direction. I, I just can't get over how beautiful that book is. It's a dancer who's forming the shapes of the letters of yeah, the alphabet. That's right. So it's almost like an uh, homage to the, to the alphabet in, mod, in, this, in this modernist style of, of poetry and, mm -hmm. and Noce Mayerova in each page is expressing the feeling of the letter everybody knows this book this is this is i think most of the institutions around the world have have found a copy of this book and they would okay. and uh, there were a th i think there were a thousand copies printed so it wasn't a huge french run and uh, but it's it's worth having so taiga did he know picasso i don't think so no no taiga was so he was 20 years old in in 1920 so he was a a little bit younger, maybe 20 years younger than Picasso. But he he ended up forming a, a strong relationship with André Breton, especially in the, in the, in the later the 1930s. Yeah. Who did he know in the in the early 1920s in, in Paris? I'm not sure. He was also publishing magazines and getting all of the the, the magazines, the, the avant-garde magazines from, from Paris. And uh, so... You translated a book on him. Yeah, I translate part of the book of with the with the strange title, uh, Carol Taiga, Captain of the Avant Garde. Almost sounds like a superhero, but I guess it's <laughs> certainly as energetic as one. Oh, he was he was in every single area of the arts, and uh, he was 
just uh, amazingly bold for I mean, he's, he's 20 years old and he was mm -hmm. going against this older Czech guard which was very strong and very conservative and uh, mm -hmm. he'd have Muka would be yeah, yeah. he'd be part of that right the, uh, the, the sort of art nouveau posters and such yeah yeah he was more of the yeah the secessionist period and and uh, so that was what uh, Tiger was fighting against and Tiger was connected to the Bauhaus. Did he teach there? Or? No, no, he did. As far as I know, he did. But again, he he, he knew what they were doing, and he, he was practicing. Or... Yes, he, he knew what he, he knew what they were doing. He was, I'm sure, he was in in contact. Also, of course, he was he was in a uh, theoretician of architecture, so <laughs> he was in yeah, he was in close contact with the German architects and. Yeah. So it sounds like almost like he's, and maybe this explains why Czech book design and magazine design of the 20s and 30s and 40s is so out front because he pulled all sorts of interesting things together from Germany and France and brought it back to Prague. I think without Karl Tiger, there would have been a much different modernist movement. I mean, there were also very strong uh, other artists who were, who were doing a lot to, to completely uh, change the, the appearance of Czech book. As I mentioned, Ladislav Sutnar. And uh, even though that they had their different communities, Sutnar wasn't really a, a part of the Deviatsil community. He was much admired by Taiga. And so they had a deep mutual respect. But you can see that, that Sutnar had a even from the like mid 1920s, he had a slightly cleaner aesthetic idea of of book design. What do you mean by that? Well, just sort of like this less crowded. Sutner wasn't really into like the the photo montage, the collage, as much as Taiga, and so he was going for this more, I would say, Bauhaus influenced, uh, maybe slightly more minimalist approach to modernist design. Yeah, because Czech book design is really important. And we're trying to get at why and why it's leading, led the world in, in that period. And it, it seems like it was these brilliant personalities and practitioners that, that kind of bounced off each other here, uh, maybe more than elsewhere. I don't know. I don't know if I would say leading the world, uh, but for a small country, it had an extremely strong response to, to modern art and to in integrate it into, into book design. But uh, there's been so many of these monographs written by people like Inge Toman. And so I think thanks to these monographs, like there's one on Josef Chopik's design, there's one on Czech, Angular style or, or Cubist style mm -hmm. that we talked about. Is he from Michigan University? Yeah, he teaches. I think he taught out there. I think I think that's right. And what else? Oh, photo montage. His his book on photo montage uh, just so beautifully maps this whole movement from about nineteen. I think it really start catches on in like nineteen twenty five to to nineteen fifty. And how did the world find out about this stuff? Then was it? Were there some sort of influential exhibitions that took place that, that these works were shown at that, the, that then sort of spread out throughout the world? Or was it just, maybe it was emigration? What, what, what was it? No, I think it was after the revolution. I know that MIT came out with a number of books, published a number of books on Czech avant-garde design, Czech art, on T Carol Taiga, Carol Taiga was was very much uh, rediscovered after the revolution. You mean like 89, 90? Yeah, yeah, okay. sorry, after the revolution. But what about at the, at the time that they were producing it in the 20s and 30s? How did that influence the rest of the world, or did it? Well, I think that Andre Breton was a major voice for the quality of Czech art, and I'm sure there are mm -hmm. a lot more, but it was also, I mean, this avant-garde movement wasn't in the 50 years or the 40 years uh, leading up to the Velvet Revolution. There weren't that many exhibitions about it. It wasn't promoted. I know there was 
a few smaller exhibitions in the 60s. And then in 1986, there was a large exhibition on Debussy where you saw a lot of this modernist book design. Mm -hmm. But Carol Tiger was a, uh, he was, even though he was, he was a, he was a leftist and he, he was a communist in the 1920s or he's promoting this, he kind of, he had this argument in this, this, this chasm appeared between him and the Communist Party in the, around the time of the uh, Soviet uh, show trials. And so up until his death in the 1950s, he was quite critical, I think privately critical of the communists. And then after that, he, there wasn't really as much attention as should have been placed on just what a uh, Renaissance figure he was in Czech modernist art. And then after the Velvet Revolution, uh, MIT published a number of works. There was a, there, I think there was an exhibition in at the University of Houston. I know they came out with a, a nice book on Czech modern art. Uh, on the cover is the Ebe said, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson may have had an exhibition in the 1990s. Also, I know that Swan Gallery was, was quick to start auctioning off and kind of spreading the knowledge about who these people like Toyen were. Who, who was Toyen? Oh, Toyen was a fascinating figure. She, she was a, a woman artist who dressed like a man and, and took the name of Toyen. And uh, I think her, her real name was Maria Chermakova. I should know this. What were her dates? She was born around, around 1900, and she died in the early 1980s. She emigrated to Paris in around World War, after World War II, but she was huge. There's, there's now a huge exhibition uh, on her work, or there was last year. It's garnered a much more attention, international attention to her, but... She did so many of these photo montage book designs and she would work with this other artist, Jindzik Stierski, and some of their poetist uh, collages are just uh, amazing works. Yeah, she was a member of the Debbie Silk group as well. Yeah, I was just trying to get at uh, how or if this groundbreaking book design work, magazine design work, got out and influenced the rest of the world because uh, I, I was just looking at, we haven't mentioned him yet, but Sadel, the, the book designer, illustrator, he was quite active in the 50s and 60s. And this was a period, late 50s, early 60s, that was really lively and bursting in, in Canada. One of the great book designers in Canada, his name is Frank Neufeld, and he has Czech, Czech origins. And his work is just uh, mind-blowingly similar to Sadal's. How did they influence each other, and how did, how did the Czech work get out around the world? Do you, do you have you know, any insight into that? Oh, the 1950s and 60s. I, oh, the, the 60s especially, I think, maybe it was a, a little bit more easy to to see what was going on. Yeah, I, I, I had the same impression with Sadal as well. I, you know, you see these illustrators from Canada or, or France or America, and you say, wow, this is very similar. There yes. must have been some kind of current going on there. <laughs> some kind yeah. of club or, you know, were there meetings? Were there associate, design association meetings that they got together at? Or yeah. what? Or could, could they get out? Could the Czechs leave the country back then. I don't know uh, how Zdeněk Sadel got his ideas. I mean, he did, if you look at his book designs from the, the 19, late 1940s to the late 1960s, this, this period of kind of like these caricature, these wild designs. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's cartoonish. It's, yeah, it kind of explodes in the late 50s and, and 60s. So yeah, I don't think he, he went everywhere. But I'm thinking of Saul Bass, too. Mm. There's, there's movie posters that he did, uh, you know, with this one, I think it's like the man with the golden arm, or something like that anyway, where there's, there's, there's parts of the anatomy that are, but there's, there are, there's something in the air that's, that's working, you know, that, that, that they're all tuning into, it seems. Zbigniew Groch conceived this Czech poster design 
uh, exhibition in 2004. And you can even see it more in the, in the Czech posters, uh, film posters of, of that period, these international influences. Mm-hmm. Um, and vice I, versa, I guess. Yeah, I think it's just printed material in the, in the 60s could come and go uh, mm-hmm. a little bit easier. And people like maybe also maybe from people having emigrants, uh, relatives, emigrants in, in these countries in Canada, being able to send things back and forth. Yeah. So that's possible. Well, you mentioned Sudnar, uh, and again, he was a book designer, poster designer, graphic yeah. artist. Sudnar, Sudnar was uh, another just an amazing influence on, on Czech book design. But he immigrated, emigrated to the States in 38. He emigrated in, in 38 or 39. He went to design the Czech Pavilion for the World Fair in New York in 1939. Which also drew attention to, to why? Well, yeah, because the country was at that point occupied by the Nazis. And yes. so uh, actually they turned the pavilion. I, I, I know that if you see pictures of the Czech Pavilion, the Czechoslovak Pavilion in 1939. Had they been thrown under the bus at that point? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so this was a pro- his way of protesting that and trying to get the world to say, you know, don't do this. Right, well, it was a protest of his country being occupied. It was a protest of, the, as you referred to, the Chamberlain waving this piece of paper. And I have in my hand a piece of paper, and that was supposed to guarantee world peace that particular line is quite resonant here, isn't it? Yeah, very, very resonant. I once went to a wedding where the groom, who was from England, had a few too many drinks and he stood up with a wedding certificate in his hand and he said, I have in my hand a piece of paper and you could hear a pin drop. It was not the reaction he wanted. So it's still sore. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Rightfully so. Uh, but sorry, to, to back, get back to Sutnar, he was, uh, so he turned the pavilion, it was kind of like a, a used to, to show that, his, his, that, that the country was uh, occupied. I remember there was actually a slogan on the facade of the building about Czechoslovakia being violated and a plea for, for independence. I can't remember the exact wording. Sutnar then, be, he became one of one of these leading uh, typographers in, in America and actually quite amazing because his, his English was so limited. But uh, I know he befriended Andy Warhol in the <laughs> 50s and uh, actually Warhol was doing some interesting typography. I think there were, that Sutner had a certain influence on him and his, his, his typographical works. Uh, but Sut- yeah, Sutner was, was doing a lot of cal- catalogs for industrial products. He was promoting this whole idea of uh, making the information as accessible as possible through typography. So you have information flow arrows throughout his designs. Eva Knobloch put on this exhibition in 2003, which was here just amazing cultural phenomenon. And uh, she brought to light again what an amazing artist Sutner was. It was, in some ways, it was a rediscovering of this chapter of typography that had been slightly ignored in this country. Also, obviously, due to the fact that Sutner was an immigrant who didn't come back after the war. Well, you mentioned that in the last 20 years or so, there's been a, quite a, uh, an active publishing program to... <laughs> I, I'm just so amazed that this country of 10 million have produced so many beautiful books about their graphic designers and book designers. It's just such an area, certainly in Canada, that, uh, and illustrators, you know, that, that hasn't really been paid much attention, but here it sure has. Yeah, it, it makes it easy for uh, someone like me who had no training in Book design. I mean, I picked it up much late, later in life. But to actually get into the culture, because a lot of these books are are just so well presented and they're they're so in depth and and the 
the other thing about it, especially with with uh, Tomon's book, was that you have suddenly these guides to getting into areas of collection which were so immense, but you didn't know existed. It was thanks actually to Yinjik Tomon's book on photo montage that I was able to start to like look into uh, putting these or mapping it for myself in my own collection. But we were looking at the state uh, Statni Nakladet tells me book today from like the works from like the late forties to the sixties, or uh, actually it's actually from the late forties to nineteen ninety five. And you're right. I mean, it's, it it's so amazing how many of these. Uh, it's respect, isn't it? It's, it is. It's, it's a deep deep respect for for the field, which you don't find uh, everywhere by any means. Um, I love that. Yeah. When you say that, I, I have to think. To think I mean, like, there, I mean, st- Stephen Heller has done a, a um, heroic job of about graphic graphic design, but I, I don't know. I, it's the, the depth and breadth of the coverage uh, here is, uh, and, and the, you know, the the work that's being done is uh, is really impressive. That's interesting you say that because I, I really don't know the scenes from the from the other countries. Mm-hmm. But why don't we get into just to sort of make it a bit more practical our conversation? Let's get into so what can people get? Like what should they go after if they if they love avant garde modernists? I mean, can you basically just describe what? what some of these these things look like? Well, of course, we talked about the photo montage. That's a large part of the... Yeah. And then you have more of these designs, Russian influence constructivist design. What, uh, is, what does that look like? Well, you have kind of these basic geometrical shapes and lines and this idea of the beauty of this, of these basic forms. Or in the mid twenties, you have a, a shift of Czech book design away from Paris and towards the east, towards Russia, and mm-hmm. led by Taiga again. And that's this more clean yeah. look, less yeah. cluttered. Yeah, yeah, kind of angular. Like, yeah, maybe if you think of a the steel painting than a Lisitsky painting. Limited palette in terms of color, or not, or very colorful, or. Uh, yeah, they're very colorful. You have one of the things we should talk about is uh, Drustevny Pratze, which was the co- Cooperative Works publisher. It was uh, another project that Ladislav Sutner was strongly connected to. So you have with with actually the covers themselves, the cloth covers, you would have much more of a minimalist design, and then with the wrappers, you would have either film stills used, more of like a, of a poster of the book. The, the works themselves were young proletarian writers or people like Czech poetry, like uh, you'd have Nazval, you'd have Seifert, then you'd have American works like Theodore Dreisern or Upton Sinclair. The, the Sutnar designs for Upton Sinclair are just amazing. You'd have kind of like these, these film stills with the logo, the Drustevny Pratza logo, very prominent on the, uh, the covers, which was also another step for, for Czech book design. It was like the idea of like promoting this uniform vision of a series and a publisher. What films? Well, let's see. Uh, like, but would they be American films or Czech films or what? You, you Probably um, American films. So, so the Upton Sinclair book about the slaughterhouse, or what is it? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, The Jungle. The Jungle. So with The Jungle, you have this shocking image of a, of a line of of slaughtered pigs hanging, you know, just a bit of a photo. I don't know if it's from a film. And then you have the, the Drustevny Pratza logo uh, prominently on the, the front cover, which was DP, mm-hmm. which he had designed in this kind of symmetrical way, the D and the P. The, cl- the cover itself took off the, the wrappers, then you'd have a, a very uniform, actually you have Upton Sinclair's initials intertwined on the cover, but all of the Sinclair uh, books published by Drustevny Pratza had the exact same design on the cover itself. So that, this is ideas. This is 
Sutnar's quite innovative advertising idea of, of promoting series, promoting publisher by easy identification of, of it. If you look at, I mean, Trushnavi Prasada, it was uh, revolutionary in the sense that it was, they were trying to make these quality but inexpensive books. They actually had different versions. They had the, the soft covers that had this blank spine and back to make it as cheaply as possible for those who didn't have. And they were really concerned with, with educating the working class. Well, it's that, like the everyman's library. And then, in fact, that's what Penguin was all about, too, apparently. Or Pelican. The Pelican books were the nonfiction ones, bringing knowledge to the working man who couldn't afford or couldn't get into university. This was the Drushtevni Pratsa in Czechoslovakia. That's what the, that was the publish house that was, that was pushing this movement here. And what, when did that kick off? Well, Sudnar took over as the artistic director of Drushtevni Pratsa, I think, in 1928. Oh, and so it's prior to Penguin. Yeah. These were paperbacks as well as art covers? Yeah, they were mixed. They, they had the paperbacks. They had uh, The paperbacks were obviously cheapy. They actually, for certain series, they would have three different versions of the paperback oh, yeah. so that they could have even the most cheap available. So they, so they could appeal to the different yeah. levels of income. Yeah. yeah, and then they would have the hardback, often with the front wrapper like, bound in the back of it. Mm. I'm not sure if that was a check creation, but I haven't seen that with other books. So it wasn't How's that again? It's the, it's, it's so you'd have the uh, front part of the wrapper, the origin, original wrapper, but it would be bound at the, or in front of the uh, back end page. So you'd have the artwork if you didn't want to have it on the outside of the cover. So it was blank? The, cup, the actual... The actual, the there, was no, was there was no wrappers on the hardcover. But they stuck the artwork in... To the back of yeah. the hardcover. That's right. Yeah. So that you wouldn't miss out on that. Yeah, so you'd have it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. I don't think I've seen that before. That's but it's funny because you know every penguin gets a lot of a lot of love for being innovative, and yet you know, I've just done a I've just done an interview on Michelle Troy on the Albatross books out of Germany that that were. In English, sorry, but they, they covered the European continent. Uh, and Lane copied a lot of what they did. I wonder who actually started this paperback bringing intelligent material to the masses in well-designed books. Well, it's, this, it's the same school of thought because Jan Chickold, who designed the, the Pe Penguin yeah. series, was... He, he, he was definitely in contact with Vladislav Sudnar, and they mutually influenced, influenced each other. Okay. So he, he came out in the late 20s with, with this new typography. Yeah. I, I'm thinking it's 1929. I mean, I'm not an expert. There's, there's a lot of people who know a lot more about uh, European and Czech book design than I am, so I'm just kind of talking really? about my head. But uh, yeah, I... I, I'm sure there's there's correspondence between Chikold and Sudnar, and I know that his uh, new 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 typography, also this this handbook that he came out with had, yeah. a, had a it has actually it has Sudnar's designs in it as uh, an example yeah, of as what an you example should do. Of, of of the proper new typography. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So again, what like what I love to do is to learn about what, what I'm learning about right now. And then take this knowledge, take it right into the used bookstores. So, you know, if someone's thinking, if I'm, I want to come over to Prague, they come here, of course, to Dan Morgan's bookstore shop. But if you want to work the, the shops in the country, what do you go after? I would say if, if you want to start up a decent, unique collection of book design, and go for the photo montage from the 1930s. You can still get it in great condition at a great uh, price. And, and at lots of used bookstores? At yeah, lots of used bookstores. And you can come across some really radical stuff done by anonymous book designers, done by students. And also, you know, this, it's, I think it's worldwide, this, this kind of shift towards ephemera. 
But yeah, yeah you could you I, could you can go into these. I fell down that rabbit hole about a year ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I love it. It's great, and you can get such an in into the culture through through ephemera. There's and there's still you know the antiquariates. The number of antiquariates is as where everywhere everywhere else in the world it's it's reduced from what it was yeah, know, ten, sadly, yeah. even five years ago. But you can still find bookshops where you can spend an afternoon looking at uncatalogued ephemera and you can you can still find great photo montage works on the on the shelves and you go back you research it you find out that Toyin was doing it and you kind of use it as a lead into the Czech culture there's no way I'm going to speak the language but <laughs> how do you use it to get into the, the Czech culture then well that's that's the thing about the Toman books the Yinjik Toman books are they're published in English by Kant by Kant, yeah. I love Kant. that. Yeah. Uh, apparently that's a one-man show. Yeah, he's, he's done amazing works to, to help people understand Czech book design. So you don't really need Czech language. I mean, minimum level of Czech language will help you immensely. But these books uh, have really mapped out the modernist book design to, to such an extent that you read the book and then you know what to look for. Right. And there's other areas. I mean, we were looking at this, the Sado designs that you picked up, what did you, you picked it up for like 60 crowns, which is about $3. A beautiful book from the 60s. They're such a large print run that, that they are, uh, you know, they're available, but... Still you gorgeous. Can, it's gorgeous, you find it in great condition, and you can you can have this great collection from the 50s and 60s of, of this, what they call it, like the second wave of, of modernist book design in this country, because the, the mid-1950s was pretty bleak from my view of, of Czech book design. And then you kind of had this open as a thawing of the culture after the denunciation of, of Stalin. I don't know if it was directly correlated, but and you, then you have designs by Sado, which are so wild compared to these, what was being designed five years prior to that. There's, and, yeah, there's something about that 55 to 65 period that expresses itself all around the world in book design. It's really an exciting time. You know, I don't necessarily get into why, but you, you mentioned this publishing house. That sounds pretty cool to go after that. Yeah, that's a great idea because it's a... Drushtevni Pratza was... It was so readily available and mm -hmm. so many people still had it in, in their own private libraries. And you can you can get these gorgeous covers by Vladislav Sutnar, you know, for and Chapek, did he do any of them? Chapek or? worked for Drusevi Prata as well. Mm -hmm. Yosef Chapek. That's a, and that's another that's another line of collection. I know that the, uh, the, there are some Japanese collectors who just love Chapek. Well, yes, apparently they put his images on everything over there, like keychains and pillows and such. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they had one of the early earliest translations of Yosef Chapek's brother, Karol Chapek's R.U.R. The person to talk to is actually Zbigniew Groch because he was over in Japan. He has this great story of, of going to the uh, fair in Japan and meeting a collector and being invited back to the collector's house and going to basically the shrine of Chapek's works. <laughs> And who would have thought? Yeah, it? being like taken down to this room, and then Groch just like looking and, and realizing that most of the books came from his shop. <laughs> you mean they were just shopping, and he didn't know it? I guess somebody, maybe there was somebody who was buying them and then for him. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. selling them to the best Japanese collector. I love that too. That that there's interest from around the world. They're revered. The, these people, you know. These, yeah, these these designers, and as I say, that gets to to my question about how influential they they were. Obviously, you know, when you see quality, anyone around the world sees quality work like that, they're drawn to it. I think that's it. One of the one of the earlier buyers, and I think he was even um, here before the Velvet Revolution, buying up lots of Czech avant garde was uh, Vlomans. In, in uh, I think they're in Amsterdam. That's that's a, a bookseller who he, had an eye for this. He had an eye for this, and he was coming in his in his car here in the late eighties and just buying up a lot of. He did, and he didn't know he didn't have any. He didn't know any Czech. 
No. You know I mean? Well, that's the nice thing about book design. It's, yeah. And again, I don't know Spanish, but I know that there's some book designers that, that uh, I can recognize and buy <laughs> without understanding the language. And that's what's so cool about this, this field, isn't it? That's right. And he, uh, I think uh, there was an exhibition of his collection or one of his collections of Czech book design in uh, Dresden recently, like five years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there was a little video of him talking about you know, how he acquired these books. And he, he, made, he made a comment that I'll never forget. He said, actually, I, I, th I thought they were funny, but they were just so visually appealing. I had no idea what they meant. He didn't know really what Carol Tiger was doing because there weren't any books about Tiger at that time. Mm. But he just had an eye that this, is, this was an Im impressive avant-garde moment in, in book design, and he bought up as much as he could. That's so smart. Yeah. And, uh, but it, it does speak to this the importance of trusting your intuition about what you think is interesting. Uh, that's what a collector has to do. Absolutely. That is actually my meager collection I have. Most of my books are, you know, you can get for four or five dollars. I've kind of changed over from the collector of, because I don't collect to, to as an investment anymore. Yeah. I just collect for what is visually striking, which I, you know, which I like to pick up and take a look at. And so I've got like 10 books, which I'm not going to sell. Just, I just like them because I find them incredibly unique. Mm. Well, and pleasing just to spend a bit of time with, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, that, and that's all another area of collection where you can just, just have a nice inexpensive collection of, of designs, which are aesthetically appealing to you. Yeah. That speak to you. Mm. Have we uh, covered the the terrain adequately? Is there anyone that we haven't talked about? In Czech book design, oh God, there's so many, there's so many areas. Well, they, the modernist, let's say, the, the the one that you focus on. There's an interesting book designer who was prolific from, and I think he's one of the few that was prolific during the first avant-garde wave. He started in the in the late twenties. He went through into the 1960s, and that was Yaroslav Schwab. It, it, it's fascinating to, because it's another one of these designers whose books are so easy to find, and you can find them in really good condition. But it's a, it, it's a, it's a great collection to have because you see the lines of influence from the 1930s and 40s to then the 1960s. With him, with him you see it in one des book designer. Where you, you can see people like Bohumil Stepan. Stepan was, was a designer of the 1960s, and he was take, he really went into this photo montage adopted from, from the 19, 1930s, except he did it in a much more humorous way. So that's another area, sort of mid-late 60s absurdist designs. Uh, Bohumil Stepan was the, I think it's actually it's Stepan, I'm not sure if it's Stepan or Stepan, but he was doing a witty designs at the time. And Absurdist in the sense that you were being governed by a completely absurd uh, mentality. Sure. Yeah. And that was, that came to an end in kind of 69 after the tanks rolled in. There was, he, he did uh, the designs for uh, a number of periodicals, which were satirical periodicals of the 19, late 1960s. It's slipping my mind right now, the periodical. But so you'd have real kind of shocking photo montages of like a woman with where her breast should be, there was a butt. Sounds like Monty Python. It was very much like Monty Python, actually. Yeah, now that you say that, it was, it was very much like this cartoon of the big foot coming down and, you know. <laughs> Making a fart sound. Yeah. yeah. And you know, people like intellectuals were all publishing in this because it was, was it was such a a time a time where the the press was so liberal of like from sixty six to sixty eight that you had like Václav Havel publishing you know his his these kind of absurdist articles and it was very light but not not actually his but a lot of the articles in these publications were were kind of poking fun at the communist systems and. And the social situation, and so yeah, that, 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 and that was also sort of tied to this absurdist book design. We we focused on uh, cubism, and you know, 
mention poetism. Did abstract expressionism have any more influence or like it, it more in the in the illustrations and woodcuts i would say than the designs and the, the covers themselves yeah so it really was cubism then would you say yeah yeah but there was there's definitely influences of expressionism and in fact sometimes i i use the term cubist expressionist cover because you have definitely elements of both yeah, uh, that's the thing. You can't pigeonhole this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, even the, the cubism itself is, uh, there are people who object to it as a misnomer, that it should actually be angular style because it's not sort of in the Picasso sense of a cubist painting these, but much more in the idea of this cubist architecture. But it's two-dimensional. I mean, it's flattened out, right? Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Kind of like flattened out cubist architecture. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm pretty keen to hit the bookstores <laughs> with this newfound knowledge now. Again, we did a bit of that, but I want to find some of that stuff. And well, I, you know that I've popped over to Krakow for the weekend and found some interesting stuff from the early 30s. And I can see, what was it called again? Pesca? Pesca, yeah. Those are, yeah. Those are stunning. Those are really nice. Uh, and, and again, it's just like I'm no expert, but I just went with hey, that looks really great and it's not expensive and it, it deserves to be <laughs> preserved and uh, researched, you know. That's the joy, the joy of, of book collecting. I think that's important also to have a, a shop where you can find these gems. Well, I that's have. what you're doing. You're gathering it together for people, right? Well, I've got, I mean, I've got rare works which are highly priced, but I also have, I kind of learned this from my aunt, Edie, who has a bookstore in Upper State, New York, called the Owl Pen. And it's for sale, right? It's, it's for sale. It's, uh, I think possibly it's already sold. Oh. It's in the process of being sold. But okay. she, she would always have this uh, system of having gems, I mean, deliberately putting gems within her book so that people can find so these. So good. Yeah. And price it so that it, the, the person that uh, buys it thinks... And knows they're getting a really good deal because they'll tell everyone about it. Exactly. Yeah. So I've tried to implement that my dear Aunt Edie's system here. So if there's there's definitely some some uh, avant garde gems in here that you'll find at a at a really surprisingly low price. Well, I know what I'm going to be doing for the next uh, half an hour then. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to you want to say to the hordes of well, it, well, there's types that are listening. I, I was going to ask you, I mean, is Krakow, is the, are there used bookstores like in the center of the city? Because Prague is, is still a pretty amazing that you could find, a, you know, we went for a walk and we hit like four or five right in the center of the city. Is that how it Yes, goes? yes. Uh, I, I hit three, three plus this uh, new bookstore that, claims to be the oldest bookstore in the world, set up in 1610. Right, that's right on the, the, the main market square. But yeah, I found a couple of stores that, uh, that were really, really uh, interesting. Uh, and in fact, I got a book called, I think it's called Very Graphic or something like that. I can't recall who, who edited it, but he, he teaches in Rhode Island. And it's a sort of compilation of essays and profiles of a ton of Polish graphic designers and book designers. So I got that and I got the magazine. So it, uh, definitely worth a, a trip there uh, because there are, in that center area, there are probably five or six. I'm going to have to get there. I've, yeah. I've lived here for 25 years and to my shame, I've never been to Krakow. Yeah, I would say for a book lover, it's a, it's a good place to hit for sure. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Just very pleasant sitting in this space of yours, carpeted space with a little courtyard in the back, right? Yeah, which is now filled, at the moment, filled up by roofing material. They're, they're repairing <laughs> the roof, but I talked to the workers. I said, uh, yeah, it's going to do the roof from January to April which in Czech parlance means sometime next year. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, very good. So, uh, so listeners can look forward to coming here and uh, admiring the new roof and the books. And so, how do they find you, uh, Dan? Uh, well, you can just come to the address and ring the doorbell. I'm here every day. What's uh, the address? Verdunska Street, number 23. Uh, or you can call my number. Uh, it's on my webpage. And what's your webpage? Uh, it's morganbooks.eu. And if you want, I send out also send out a list of new arrivals every month, so you can just write your your email and I'll add you to the list. And also, we have a cultural evening here. It's called Tuesday at 6 p.m. And... Uh, That's what it's called? Yeah. It's quite creative. That's creator, good. That's creator very, no, Actually, no, it's, it's called Tuesday at 6. <laughs> so you, and it's on Wednesdays, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can, you can show up at Tuesday at 6. I know we're, we're officially open to the public on, on Tuesdays, but if you ring the doorbell twice, then you can get in with a secret, secret bell ringing of two times, anytime you want. Wonderful. Well, thanks again for taking the time to talk. It's been delightful. Thanks, Nigel.